Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland. This is relaxation, hypnosis, the stress, anxiety, and panic attacks. Please and listen when you can safely close your eyes. And please subscribe wherever you're listening. And you can you can listen to this on lots of different podcast hosts or suppliers such as iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, Google Play, I think uh, you know, lot of just or Google Podcasts loads of different places including the Spreaker plus all of my recordings are available to stream for free and to download for free on my website so that's pretty groovy so you know this recording is going back to 2006 yep I really am that old I've been doing this a while a while. So I hope you're well. I hope you're I hope you're able to you know keep relaxed whenever possible. But you know, I was thinking I'm gonna do kind of the the opposite to what you would normally hear. in a recording which is technically aimed at reducing your anxiety levels Uh, basically what I'm going to say in this recording is it's okay to feel anxious I don't mean all the time It's natural to have anxiety at times in certain circumstances. And I sometimes feel that having in the past had uh, such high levels of anxiety that there's almost a a sense of I should never have any anxiety ever again because I should be all cured from it and I should be able to deal with every single thing that ever happens in my life which is ridiculous it's a silly idea isn't it what a pressure to put ourselves under the idea that we should you know, be able to deal with everything and never, ever, ever, ever feel stressed or anxious, ever. If anything, that that would cause more stress, wouldn't it? Or it could cause denial to the point where perhaps we're not giving ourselves the attention and dealing with it. which could lead to it getting worse. So, an example for me today was I had a a bill come in from uh, not a person called Bill, a financial a financial expectation of money from me to them which was not going to happen and uh, it was a podcast host and uh, they wanted $430 from me and it was out of the blue I had no idea I basically overused their service without realising it and hadn't read the small print 
so I spent a couple of hours or three hours nearly online and on the phone trying to sort it out today or yesterday and my anxiety levels were high I mean I sometimes wonder what's the difference between stress and anxiety the stress levels are up so maybe that's not anxiety maybe we should only call anxiety anxiety when it's to do with something that we're going to do something that perhaps we're avoiding doing because of how we're feeling but the stress is the actual feeling we have when we're doing that thing maybe regardless I'll just use whatever words I feel like really because ultimately it's just a description of a feeling uh, which isn't pleasant is it and there was so much frustration and worry see the worry the anxiety for me really was the more the worry of what if I can't get it sorted what if I can't get the uh, the amount that they want uh, just dismissed or uh, you know come to an agreement or something with them so that's where the anxiety was the stress levels were rising up due to me feeling that I wasn't getting anywhere that uh, you know I just started to feel ill but I kept at it and I got the bill down to $50 and it's still way more than I could afford to pay but I paid it and so the the anxiety kind of reduced because I was no longer concerned about the future as far as that particular situation was concerned so you know what I was starting to think bailiffs are going to be knocking on my door how am I going to get $400 where's that going to come from I, you know it's just I just didn't I couldn't kind of figure it out how I was going to how I was going to get it but once that was sorted it reduced but the physical feelings in my body uh, kind of didn't and even when I got to the end of it I felt frazzled which is a lovely word isn't it I did I felt fra- I felt burnt out and I needed to just lay down and be on my own and that's what I need I need to be on my own to recover or to recuperate some people prefer to be with other other people to recuperate uh, some people might prefer to do some exercise others might need you know want to read a book or watch a film you know we've all got our own uh, ways of recuperating from stressful situations mine is being on my own and then quite often laying down on the bed for an hour or so and I started thinking this thing, this this situation kicks in every single time I have any sort of degree of anxiety or stress there's a a judgement comes in my mind I judge myself I seem to judge myself why why are you getting stressed or it's more like so you're still getting stressed are you you still have an anxiety it's more very sarcastic kind of voice in my head a little bit and 
and there's more to it. It's like, oh, so you're making podcasts, you're making recordings, trying to help people, other people with stress and anxiety, but you have it yourself. How can you help other people? You're a fake. It's that little kind of thing that goes on a little bit. And I don't feel guilty. It just That isn't a fear, fear. Well, no. It's not a feeling of guilt, I would say. It's a feeling of... It feels a bit absurd. And that I would be making recordings like this when I still deal with that stuff myself sometimes but it's nowhere near the level it used to be you know for me I know it's it's, I don't know it's probably a really terrible analogy but it, it, for me it's the equivalent of being in bed after a terrible terrible accident in a hospital bed and further down the line when I'm perhaps on crutches or maybe I'm in a wheelchair and I can get around I'm not long, no longer in the pain I was in but uh, so I'm trying to think of a decent analogy that doesn't um, but just there's such a difference between where I am now and where I was. I thought I was going absolutely crazy when I was going through the anxiety at, the, at its worst point. I thought that my brain, that there was something physically wrong with my brain. I did, I thought I was losing my mind and I wasn't and no one listening to this is either and even though I was diagnosed with anxiety disorder and you know, whatever the doctor decided that week to, to diagnose me with recurrent depression you know he started to run out of things to give me I think and that's the thing you know with a diagnosis I think it is helpful but someone did say what's the difference when you got the diagnosis and I said nothing really I have diagnosis but the symptoms are still the same I walked out of the psychiatrist's office with the label I don't really think of it as a label but with a diagnosis of bipolar affective disorder I'm still me I'm still the same person I was when I walked into that office and I didn't it, it was a big deal but it wasn't it wasn't the same as I imagine it would be for someone who'd just been diagnosed with uh, a really serious physical condition. It just this somehow feels different. It might not be different, but in my mind, how I dealt with it, and because you know I was given a diagnosis and almost like, well, this is a lifelong condition. And this is it. You can have medication to maintain your condition. To manage your condition. But with anxiety, having stress, having anxiety is on some level a lifelong condition just like breathing 
just like needing to eat, just like sometimes getting angry, emotions. It's natural to have anxiety and stress at times, but not at the level, not at the unhealthy level, because that, it can't last. It never lasts. It doesn't last in the short term, which means it can't last in the long term. And I really am talking from experience here. And I know that I don't, I'm not wearing your shoes. Unless of course I am, I apologize. I just love stealing shoes. But I don't know what it's like to be you. You don't know what it's like to be me. We don't, we don't really know what it's like to be each other. But I know what it's like for me to experience extreme anxiety and stress, to be physically ill, to be almost not able to function. Actually, not almost, I've been unable to function. And I still get that as part of the bipolar. There's times when I just can't function. It's, it's almost like my whole body just shuts down. My brain just shuts down. Another way to get me to get, if you want to increase my stress levels instantly, hand me a big form to fill in. That's a trigger for me. A big form, you know, 10, 20 pages. Even if the information's easy, my brain, I don't know why, my brain shuts down. Always has done. And it's not something that I want to happen. It's not something that I'm just allowing to happen and just, you know, giving up on myself. My, my brain just slows down to the point of sometimes not being able to function until I get rid of that form and then I can move on. So it's, it's a weird one, but that's just one of my little things, one of my little quirks. In the same way is if, if I'm doing something and you was to stand over me while I did it and watch me, uh, almost like hurry me along, then I, I stop functioning. And that might be a universal thing, I don't know. But I'm not, I don't, again, that could be nothing to do with bipolar, nothing to do with anxiety, nothing to do with any kind of mental health issue. It might just be a learned behavior from childhood. It might just be the way that I am. It might just be the way that most people are. Who knows? It's not something that I've discussed with other people. But coming back to the original title is it's okay to feel stress it's okay to feel anxious. And maybe that should be a question, is it okay? Because you may not feel it is. And that makes sense because, let's face it, none of us want it, do we? But I could easily say it's okay to have a headache. And you could say, no, it isn't. I don't want a bloody headache. But it is okay to have a headache. Everybody occasionally has a headache. It's not pleasant. Of course it's not. Just like everybody occasionally gets constipated. It might only happen a couple of times in your life, 
but it happens to everybody. Everybody gets a bad stomach sometimes. You know, everybody, you could say everybody everything sometimes, which doesn't make sense, but it just... It's okay to just be human. Part of being human is to have stress and to feel anxious at times. And probably the only reason why it's a big issue um, for maybe us, those of us, you listening and me, is because of the connotations that come with it, because of the memories, because of the connections. Um, almost like, oh, if you even have 1% of that feeling, where's it leading? Because 1% one per, one of an anxiety attack or uh, a panic attack is, what's well, nothing, is it, 1%? That would be mild, mild, mild stress. Very mild. So when you break it into percentages, you start to realise that, oh, okay. So you could have 10% of a panic attack and actually, it's not that unpleasant. In the same way as if you had boiling water. You know, you get to, you put your hand to the point where you have to take your hand out of the water because it's too hot. It's scalding your hand. Then cut that temperature. So you divide that temperature into 10. So whatever temperature it is where your hand can't be in there because it's just, you know, it's like when you've got your hand under the hot tap when you're washing your hands and suddenly you've got to take your hand from underneath it. It's not damaged your hand, but it's it's not pleasant. And it only lasts for like a minicule of a second and you put your hand out and maybe you stick it under the cold tap <laughs> or run and jump into a freezer or something. So, but then you break that into 10 bits, 10 percentages. So take it down to 50% of the heat. Would you be able to have your hand in that, under that tap, if it was half of the heat, what it is, which is impossible to touch? I think the answer would be yeah on that one, wouldn't it? And I'm not talking about a volcano. Well, actually, half a temperature of a volcano would still be too hot. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about a tap. I'm talking about something that's really, really unpleasant. Really, that you can't, you know, it's too much to deal with. So you take your hand out. Add enough water, so you know it's all coming out of one little nozzle. Add enough cold water so it's half the temperature. Your hand will go under there easy. In fact, it's probably going to feel warm at best. That's at 50%. At 10%, it's probably going to feel quite cold actually. So 10% of an anxiety attack is not going to cause any problems. The only problems is the anticipation, isn't it? Well, that's 10%. What if it goes, you know, what, 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 what? Well, actually, having anxiety and stress is natural, as I said earlier. Well, we all know this, really, don't we? It's natural. We've all had 
times in our lives when we felt anxious and it hasn't been like this big major thing didn't affect our life maybe had an effect on us at the time in that moment and it could have been as simple as going out on your first date you know you go into prom or go into a party walking up to a boy or a girl and asking them if they want to dance I don't think anybody in that situation however young or old would do that without feeling anxious beforehand even professional athletes you know the the fastest runner in the world about to do the 100 metres and they're walking up you know to the their little whatever they call it when they kneel down you're telling me they're not feeling anxious with those thousands of people watching you know in the, in the audience millions around the world their whole career you know, the next year of money and sponsorship will be based upon this one performance. Which often it comes down to, doesn't it, in the Olympics. The 100 metre goal in the Olympics can be the difference between being a superstar and having silver. Now that gold medal is... It's a biggie, isn't it? So that person that knows what they're doing and spends their whole life aimed at that 100 metre, that 9.6 second run, however, however long it takes, they know exactly what they're doing and they're preparing, a, all they're doing is preparing for that. Yet yeah, they're still going to be anxious. So, and I'm not talking about anxiety in the sense of it helps your performance because, yeah, a lot of sports people do say that. But I'm just talking generally because we're not all performers, are we? You know, we're just asking someone out for a date or to dance or uh, even putting your hand up to get the attention of a waiter or waitress or waiting staff whatever the correct term is some people wouldn't want to say anything because they may feel anxious too anxious to do that and that might you know what that might be absolutely norm, normal it might be normal it's it, what's wrong with that that's what I'm trying to say Now, years ago, I did. Uh, I performed performed on the comedy circuit for eight years, and without a huge success, to be fair. But you know, I went on stage about two hundred and fifty times in front of you know, thousands over the years. And then I was in this comedy club, and I was no longer on the circuit, but I was helping out in this my friend's club. And I, I needed to go on stage and just ask whoever owned the Ford Cortina, who, which was blocking the, the car park, to move it. And I felt anxious. I actually couldn't believe that I felt anxious. In fact, I felt possibly more anxious doing that than going on stage and... Uh, making a fool of myself purposely so anxiety and it wasn't that was not a performance that was just you know just go on there and do it and then get off so I think I mean you know you could say oh this is the personal opinion of you you think anxiety is normal levels of anxiety are normal not extreme anxiety 
I want to say not normal, I mean, well, it's not healthy, it's not sustainable, is it? Extreme anxiety continuously is physically and mentally damaging. It's exhausting. And when I say it's not sustainable, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not something that can, and that's, I think that's part of the reason why it doesn't last, is because it can't last, because the, the energy involved in it to keep those, that, you know, that buzzing, that constant vibration -y kind of crap that's going on inside you during a, a panic attack or anxiety the body can't keep producing it that energy is not sustainable it starts to slow down it starts to die away which is why we, we wouldn't call them panic attacks if it was going the whole time. If it was happening the whole time, it wouldn't have a name like that. And as we all know, nothing is always the same. No emotions are always there. Even the most angriest people are not always angry. It's impossible to always be angry. It's impossible to always be happy. As in smiling all the time. It's impossible. I mean, we're human beings with emotions. Different emotions. And it's natural to have those different emotions. Including anxiety. And I suppose if you think of anxiety as an emotion, the same as anger, the same as gratitude, is kind of an emotional feeling, isn't it? It's a feeling. The same as love, the same as... I mean, you could say a feeling, hunger is a feeling. Neediness, you know, the need for something is a feeling whether that need is for human contact or maybe that need is um, to go for a walk or to have exercise or lay down wherever the need is it's a feeling isn't it it's a feeling that you've got that need And on a kind of a, a safe level of anxiety and stress, it's just part of day-to-day -day living. So I guess in a way what I'm sort of saying is to not expect to abolish all anxiety and stress forever and ever and never ever experience any kind of unpleasant feelings because that is unrealistic. It's kind of, I think it's obvious. And also it takes that pressure off yourself when you start, you know, not giving yourself a hard time because basically you're a human being with feelings. You know, perhaps that's not a reason to feel guilty or a reason to give yourself crap because you're a human being and having anxiety or stress is not a failure. It's not normal, it's not abnormal. You know, it's just, it just is. And the word normal and I know it, people like to say, well, that's normal, but whatever normal is. And it kind of gets very, like, gets a bit confusing about almost is it, 
is it an insult? Is it is it compliment? Is it what is it when you're using the word normal? And you could say, is it normal to go to the toilet? Is it normal to feel hungry? Is it normal to breathe? Is it normal to uh, feel the cold in the winter when you go outside? So you wrap up. Maybe need the heating on inside. You know, it's, yeah, it's normal, but we don't call it normal, do we? We just accept it for what it is. Is it normal to get angry? Sometimes when something happens that upsets us. Something doesn't go our way the way that we wanted it to or expected it to. Is it, is it normal to, to feel upset when something happens to someone you care about? Uh, you know, bereavement, is that normal? Of course it's all normal but we don't call it normal do we we don't call it abnormal we just accept it so maybe we don't have to sort of go down the road of labeling things normal or abnormal right or wrong and I think the I know it's, I kind of mentioned this before, but when you got that door open, or you got that, you know, the uh, the bridge to the castle. What's that called? You know the <laughs> what is it called? The, the you know when they lower the bridge, and you can get over into the castle. Well. If you just leave it down the whole time, drawbridge, that's it. If you can leave it open the whole time, instead of just opening and lowering it for the things and the feelings that you choose you want. So you can, you know, lower it for the nice feelings, but quickly pull it up in case a, um, an unpleasant feeling arises. The thing is, the feelings are coming so quick, from different angles, sometimes together. You know, not everything's quite as black and white as being pleasant or unpleasant. There can be a few, you know, a mixture of things going on. You know, and there can be a bereavement, but there could be an inheritance at the same time. So it's an unpleasant situation. But there's something pleasant happens after that unpleasant situation, possibly. Which doesn't change the fact it was an unpleasant situation. And although the two are connected in a way, they're two separate things. Two separate emotions. So you can feel, look, look forward to something and still have anxiety about it. Uh, I remember when I, when I had sex the first time, where I lost my old virginity. And I was petrified, if I'm honest with you. I was. I was petrified. And the, the, I, was, I was 19, and the lady was 25, and she was my girlfriend. And I even talked to her about it. I said, I don't know. I just don't know if I want to do it. I'm scared. So this pleasant experience... Was I also had this real anxiety connected to it. So 
So things are not always quite as straightforward, are they? Like if you're at university or college, school, or just studying, whatever, you finish, you push yourself to finish that essay. And it might be stressful and it might be unpleasant. But the relief when it's done, the relief when it's done is pretty phenomenal. It can be. I don't know. I can't talk for everybody. But it feels good when it's done. And then you hand it in. And maybe there's anxiety. And not knowing what the what the marks are going to be. And the lead up. And you go to collect the results. And maybe there's anxiety connected to that process of walking to college or, you know, getting the bus, driving, whatever, and going to collect the results. And then you've got the the pleasure when you see that you passed. And regardless of what mark you get, there's almost a relief as well. Release of stress. Relief because it's done. Even if you haven't perhaps got the marks you wanted, even if you have to retake it, disappointment, another feeling. But also a sense of, okay, I have to, might, I might have to retake it, but I haven't got to think about that until we go back in six weeks' time. It's this constant change in feelings, stress, anxiety, pleasure, unpleasant things, pleasant things, happiness. I think we start mixing it in. And seeing anxiety and stress in the same way as you see happiness, disappointment, hunger, feeling horny, feeling relaxed, feeling tired, needing to go to the toilet. feeling sweaty, feeling the need to have a shower, feeling chatty. You know those times? It might uh, surprise you that sometimes I like to chat, but sometimes I've been in my life, I've wanted to chat, like really just talk the ears off someone. It's like a need. Other times, I want to just want to be on my own and not see anybody. It's a feeling. It's a feeling, oh, I feel I want to step back. Sometimes a conversation with someone's beautiful. Sometimes it's unpleasant. Sometimes the stress levels rise because I just don't want to talk to them or I'm not in the mood. Or I need my own space and I perhaps can't think when someone else is talking about something that I'm not interested in. And I'm only talking from my own perspective, my own. And it doesn't happen that often, I'll be honest with you. So it's, you know, it has in the past. So we start looking at anxiety and stress and joyfulness and sense of comfort relaxation uh, optimism looking forward to something feeling grateful feelings just feelings And they start to get all mixed together. I don't mean mixed together as in one big um, smoothie, necessarily. 
are just mixed together as in they rise they rise up and then they just fall away they rise and then they fall away like the waves of the ocean coming in and then going out again coming in and then going out again coming in and the wave the water doesn't either it neither stays in nor it stays out those waves are continuously flowing so you start looking at you know going back to that idea of the hand being under the really hot tap when you realise that actually within that tap you've got the cold water you've got the different percentages 10% of that heat has other things mixed in with it some relaxation some optimism maybe you know maybe some excitement maybe that that anxiety it's, it's, you feel anxious about maybe going to a wedding you know because there's going to be a lot of people there but maybe you're feeling the, that feeling because you've also got a feeling of excitement maybe you'll see someone uh, that you haven't seen for a long time one of your cousins or um, maybe you'll meet someone or maybe this will be a date you go, you're going to take your new boyfriend or girlfriend to this wedding or perhaps you're just like me you're just looking forward to the free food I love free food and free free uh, wine I don't even drink but if it's free I'll drink it so love free stuff <laughs> so free chocolate if I could get hold of free chocolate I would be I wouldn't be able to get in and out of the doorway, honestly. I'd be so big. Instead of my normal huge size. So there's you got these feelings. It's feelings. Different mixtures of feelings. It's not just one thing. When you break it down, everything has different components. Nothing is just one thing. You know, get a microscope out. Well, obviously, unless you've got one. If you haven't got one, then don't. But if you, anything you've got, you can say, well, this uh, television remote control, that's what it is. You know, I could say that's what it is. It's made of plastic, that's it. But if I got a microscope, like a really powerful microscope, I'd start to see that it's not just plastic. That plastic is, there's a lot more going on than just that uh, immovable object that seems to be solid. When actually nothing is solid, not really. It's all just energy. It's all a mixture of things. So anxiety isn't just one thing. Feeling happy isn't just one thing. Feeling excited isn't just one thing. Feeling disappointed isn't just one thing. Gratitude isn't just one thing. I'm not going to go through every single feeling or emotion possible. I think you get the point. It's not just one thing. Andre running around and doing poos on the floor isn't just one thing. Although it does seem to do it whenever I'm making a recording. Although it's been quite quiet. So I'll leave you on that. It's basically now that he's come out to play, I'll leave you because he'll be running around in a minute. Just, just think about it. It's okay to have feelings. Just, it's okay to have feelings of any kind. You 
Right now, my feelings probably going to be of anger towards Andre for making noise when everything was going quite quite quietly. But then I look at, down at him, and I just see how cute he looks, and I think, oh. And now as I watch him go back into his little bed, I see his body disappear and his tail's now gone. I feel grateful that he's now quiet again. So the feelings are always changing. Do they actually stay the same? They're not static. They're fluid, always flowing. So yeah, that's that's kind of it really. So I know it kind of sounds like a weird title for uh, anxiety stress session recording to say it's okay to feel stressed and anxious. Or should I put it's natural to feel stressed and anxious? To feel I don't know what well, I don't know what the title will be, but that's the gist of what I'm saying. But that title would also be, it's okay to feel happy. It's okay to feel relaxed. It's okay to feel um, rejection at times. It's okay to feel excited. It's okay to feel optimistic. It's okay to feel hungry. It's okay to feel whatever you feel. Just a feeling. Just a feeling. That's it. And that's not dismissing it because I'm talking about all feelings are just feelings. They're feelings. They're emotions. They come and they go. They come and they go. Constantly. And if you focus deeply on them, put a microphone, microphone, a microscope rather, onto that feeling, and you see that there's more going on there. It's not just one feeling, it's a mixture of things. That sense of anxiety or stress isn't just stress. It might be excitement, might be a bit of regret there, there might be a bit of like real, you know, happiness. There might be some joy in there. There might, it could be all sorts of things. And it's always moving, always moving, always flowing. So yet again, I've gone on for quite some time. So I'm going to go. Thank you for listening. And remember, 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 remember to be kind to yourself because you do deserve to be happy and you do deserve to remember just feelings, they're all just feelings. So being kind to yourself is just a feeling. And by acting upon that, by doing something nice, whatever it might be, gives you more feelings, pleasant ones. So take care of yourself and I will speak to you very soon. Lots of love.